Good afternoon and welcome to a workshop meeting of the Oak Harbor City Council. It is Wednesday, February 22nd, uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We are scheduled to uh, uh, meet between 3 and 5 this afternoon and note that no action will be taken at this uh, workshop meeting. Uh, but we do have several items on our agenda today uh, under department briefings, pending agenda items, and an emerging issue. We'll start off with uh, department briefings uh, at 1A, which is a presentation on archaeology, and I see our city engineer, Joe Stoll, at the end of the table. Uh, why don't we go around the table kind of quick like and just introduce ourselves here. Sure. I'm Joe Stoll, city engineer. Gideon Kaufman, I'm the archaeologist for the city. Kelly Bush, I'm archaeologist with Equinox Research. Beth Munn, City Council. Bob Severns, Mayor. Erica Wassinger, City Council. Joel Fredius, City Council. Okay, thank you much. We have uh, several staff and some uh, citizens, it looks like, in the audience here with us today, and we welcome you and those uh, watching on TV. Back to you, Joel. Take it right, away. Thanks, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, we've, we've talked for some time about uh, providing an update uh, on archaeology just in general. We talked a little bit last night at the, the council meeting about a specific item, but this, this I wanted to broaden it out a little bit and talk about what we've learned since, uh, uh, since Pioneer Way. And we haven't really reported back to council much about what happened there, so I brought Kelly along to talk a little bit about uh, how Pioneer Way uh, came along. And then I want to start looking forward, like come up out of the ground. We've got the buildings along Pioneer Way that are historic and move even further out into how we want to plan for the future. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kelly and have her do her presentation and pass it off to Gideon to do his and we'll answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much for um, having me here finally. Um, because not that I don't love answering your questions in council meetings about the finance and the business, what I really love to do is to talk about archaeology. And um, the recovery project at Pitt Road was an interesting and surprising um, project on many levels. When I started in archaeology in 1988, it was because I was fascinated about the stories that um, come from the objects and the features and the modifications to the landscape that I'd seen around me growing up here on the West Coast. And so revealing those stories behind what we encounter um, is interesting and complicated. And um, now all these years later, I recognize the value of all the people that are part of telling that story um, because there's uh, so many specialties and specific interest areas. So the slides I'm showing you today were created by a lot of different people at ERCI, um, not just me, but I am excited to talk about, uh, speak about them. Ooh, how do I make it go forward, with the arrow? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the Pioneer, or the Pit Road Recovery Project came up out of the, um, the Pioneer Way Road Project where um, we got you know, a good way of the way through the uh, road work before encountering this archaeological site, and it was a surprise. Um, the work that ERCI ended up doing was processing the material up at um, the Pit Road site and four other remote sites uh, where material had gone to from Pioneer Way. So, um, it was 13 months of field work, so we screened for 13 straight months uh, from May 2012 to June 2013. And the unanticipated discovery, as I mentioned, was um, in the Pioneer Way project. So the recovery plan was developed as part of the mitigation. Um, so I'm just going to throw out some numbers uh, about the um, the pit road portion of the project. So we screened, hand screened, and machine screened over 6,200 yards of material. Um, we got six permit amendments. Um, there was five different locations covered in this project. The average daily crew size was 30 people. We got 118 stone tools, 70 bone artifacts, 21 shell artifacts, we curated over 1,300 historic artifacts. Um, we documented <clears throat> over 40,000 historic fragments that were not curated at the Burke Museum. 
Um, over 11,000 animal bones. We have tens of thousands of photographs. Uh, quarter inch mesh, we used over 1,100 feet of it. And I stopped counting at the 10,000, after I reached 10,000 buckets that we had used to do all the work. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a day in the life. Um, screeners would work uh, eight hour days, um, bringing the objects and human remains to the field lab for processing inside the trailer that the city had provided on site for us, which was, um, it made all the difference between being able to take care of the paperwork and um, tracking of the artifacts and uh, other objects that we were trying to manage. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about human remains today. How we care for these critical remains um, continues to be kind of a private protocol that's agreed to by the state, city staff, and the tribal representatives. What I always say to my staff is that teach each, treat each fragment respectfully, keep it secure, and that's what we do. We uh, keep them, continue to keep them secure until reburial time. Um, so <clears throat> once the objects were um, carried inside from the processing, so some of the work was done in good weather and some of it was done um, in terrible weather through that winter. We, there was a, a number of months where there was a person dedicated every day to nothing but m mud and water management with a bobcat, and yet they continued to work. So they worked through all weather. We did call one day when the wind was so bad that it would picked up the corners of our canopy and was threatening to carry people away with it. Um, so I had to pick and choose what I was going to talk about today because there's so many different components to the assemblages. Um, but because we had over um, 11,500 um, animal bones, I decided that this was a good thing to talk about. So you can see by the, um, the graph that we've got primarily mammal bones, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is that mammal bones are bigger and preserved better. Um, also, they were probably more visible in the sediments, so both of those things are true. So elements um, is the, the place on the body, the thing, the part, like the, the limbs or the ribs, that's what the element is. And um, so one example of, of a mammal that we examined was cow, we had a lot of cow. It was the most prevalent um, mammal type that we had. And the interesting part of it is that all of the body parts were represented. So if you go to a modern butcher today, say you go to Hagen and you look in their garbage cans, what you're gonna find there is only those parts of um, a cow that are in final preparation. So you're not gonna find hands and feet or heads. You're just not. You're gonna find like um, flanks, you're gonna find shoulders. So that's the kind of waste product you'll see at a Hagen for example, or a safe way today. If you go to like um, a rural animal specialist, like I keep pigs, um, so I have a guy that comes out and takes care of that so I don't have to. And he'll dispatch the animal on my property, loads it up in his truck, and then he goes back to his shop and he processes there. If I look through his garbage can, I'm gonna find hands and feet and heads. <clears throat> what we have on Pioneer Way is everything. So they were processing the entire beast down there. And since it was mostly cows, and what we had, we also had sheep and um, pigs, but mostly what we have is cows. Um, they were probably process. They were probably actually raising animals near Pioneer Way and walking them down to the butcher shops and having the entire creature processed right there. We do have some deer. Um, it's the most prevalent non-domestic animal. Uh, and it's the same thing. It, it had the deer uh, elements were also had all the body parts. So that's just one example. So that what it suggests is that the whole animals were being raised, processed, and butchered or consumed um, near Pioneer Way. So the marks on the animal bones. Um, over 1,100 of the <coughs> animal bone, uh, the mammal uh, assemblage. Had, um, bone, uh, had marks on them, and you can see 93% of those were bandsaw marks. So they weren't chainsaw, they weren't circular saw, they weren't ax marks. This is a butcher. These are butcher shops. This is not pre-contact ax marks. These aren't bone saws. This is the bulk of the animal bones that we encountered were from 
relatively modern butcher shop, so last 110 years. And um, yeah, even in the last 3% too, it was just the bone was too weathered, but um, they mostly looked like um, bandsaw cuts too. Um, and then that's just an example of what a bandsaw cut looks like. So it's to, this also supports the idea that the animals were um, butchered, the entire animal was butchered right along Pioneer Way. Okay, and so with a little bit of historic research, we took a look at, this is the 1929 um, Sanborn maps, which is an insurance map. These guys are awesome. They were creating maps about everything in the past. And we see some locations of some historic butcher markets. This map also represents the last few days of excavation prior to the Pioneer Way Road project being um, temporarily stopped. So you can see the color coding. Oh, this is where I'm going to try and use the little color. So this green area here, that was on June 14th. The purple area down here, June 13th. And the last day was right here on the 16th and this big blue area here on the 15th. So what that means is piles were moved to Pit Road on those days from these areas. And in, in that area, we have two butcher shops. So it really helped to explain why we had such a massive um, mammal bone assemblage. And here's a little bit of advertising that the guys found about the oak leaf meat market. So when I talk about, um, cuts. This is what um, a lot of modern butchers will get. So some, at some point in time, this guy was actually doing a more massive um, cutting and processing out back. And this is what he was showing people. And then he'd be uh, reducing that down. So we're already missing hands, feet, cranium. And uh, this is what, you know, this sort of the secondary stage of processing. I love these old pictures, though, showing people what they were actually doing. OK, I included this. You're going to actually see this slide, uh, our variation on this slide a few times. This is a conceptual drawing of the piles out at um, Pit Road that we processed. So each one of these circles is a pile and a number. And everything that we screened was tied back to that pile so we could try and rebuild how it was pulled together. These dates along the base here are the four days in June prior to the project being temporarily shut down. And that was from some interviews that happened pretty quickly after the project was shut down where they tried to talk, where uh, the Swick archaeologists were talking to the truck drivers and they were trying to figure out where, this, um, where these piles came from. The, the reality is, is that the piles were getting deposited, then they would get smoothed out, and then another truck would back over and dump another pile. It wasn't quite as clean as how it looks in the picture. Um, and when we arrived, also we knew that there had been some piles that had been deposited here from the Frostad Road project that was going on at approximately the same time. Um, but I've included this because the distribution of the burden fish bone was very different than the distribution of the mammal bones. So we have the green piles are fish bone where we have more than the, a small amount of fish bones and the pink is where we have um, more than our usual amount of bird bones. So there's a few, I'd like you to take a note of pile three, pile 10, pile 58 and pile 77. Those piles are gonna come up repeatedly. Um, and when I mentioned previously about uh, preservation where small bones don't preserve as well. Um, bones in general don't preserve as well in the Pacific Northwest in our upland sites because the soils in our forests tend to be acidic. <clears throat> but down on our shorelines where we often have um, large cultural sites that are predominantly shell, so we have big shell mounds along our shorelines, those, um, those sediments are more alkaline because of the calcium carbonate in that shell. And that's why we get so much better bone preservation. Horn, antler, and other fiber, perishable fibers, preserve a lot better in that shell. Um, those four piles also were predominantly shell-rich piles, unlike many of the piles that look like um, a lot of roadbed that we find uh, anywhere. 
So I pointed out four piles. There was a fifth pile up here, but the four piles that I pointed out to you are the ones that we see consistently have slightly different artifacts, slightly different bone counts. They also ended up being the piles that had more um, human remains. Okay. Um, so what did we learn from the animal bones? Well, what I've already said. Domestic food animals, including cow, sheep, and pig, were the highest percentage of the um, assemblage, and they were likely um, processed right downtown, and I think they probably also lived close to downtown. Non-domestic food animals, the deer and elk, so we don't see elk on the island much today, but um, in archaeological sites on Woodby Island, elk is a, is a dominant species. So in our other sites in um, Oak Harbor, uh, pre-contact sites, older sites, we have a lot of elk deposits. They're a small and localized component. Again, we found a lot of them in those four piles. Um, some of the piles at Pit Road were likely from the vicinity of the known butcher shops. And the abundance and distribution of the bird and fish bones is greater in the redeposited piles identified as containing dense pre-contact materials. Okay. Historic artifacts. I'm going to talk a little bit about historic artifacts now. The first slide I'm showing you is these non-curated items. So for three months we collected this kind of material and documented it day in and day out um, until we had 40,000 pieces and then I felt like I had reached redundancy. I went to the Department of Archaeology, I said, we've collected enough, we need an amendment, we don't need to collect these anymore. We can say something about it. We were able to say this is the kind of trash that it is in general. None of these artifacts had maker's marks, none of them could tell us a deep story. That was our first um, permit amendment. And so we continued to collect them, but we didn't document them. It saved us almost a, one person a day in the lab, stopping that particular process. So almost a full person day in the lab. It meant that on slow days, on days where we didn't have a lot to process, one person could manage the lab. Okay, metal historic artifacts. Um, here's a wide selection of them. The bulk of them are uh, bullet casing and shotgun shells. And we believe that a lot of those came from the piles that were probably from Frostad Road. Not that people don't shoot and love to shoot and they've been shooting in all sorts of different places, including Pioneer Way. But um, the Frostad Road, after we went down and took a look at it and we all decided it was a great place to shoot. And that's <laughs> probably where a lot of the um, bullets shotgun shells and um, liquor bottles <laughs> were coming from, of which we also had many um, of those. Okay, historic artifacts, ceramics. So I include this because these are really small fragments too, right? But these have a story to tell. Um, all of these maker's marks, um, there's enough of them that we can go back and find something else about them. So what I want you to look at is age of range of manufacturer. And um, these dates are when this particular maker's mark would have been started to be in use. So we have some really old dates here. Now some of these get used right up into the present, Homer Laughlin, of course, and then some of these others, Adams, Meekins. So we can't say for sure when that is, but some of these have a much smaller time frame. So like 1840 to 1890, that means artifact 439 was manufactured in that time frame. Now somebody might have hung on to it for a while, but that artifact was manufactured in that time frame. And so we had you know, hundreds of these artifacts that we were able to um, get within a, a time frame that was pretty exciting. And, and definitely um, during the earliest years of Oak Harbor's development, and more than likely, lots of them, um, people, settlers who were coming here had brought with them from home that this not something that they were buying while they were here. They definitely brought it from home. Okay, shell artifacts. Um, I've included three types here. The dentalium on the left is a pre-contact ceremonial shell that's used um, in ritual and in garments that um, people were using in the more distant past. Shell scrapers are also more common in the pre-contact artifacts all up and down the coast, but the buttons were actually pretty interesting, and we had lots of them. We had hundreds of buttons. And the buttons are interesting because I'm uh, pretty sure that they represent a time period from just before we had started seeing a lot of immigrants to through the time period where we had a lot of settled immigrants here. And so this particular artifact type 
represents that transition of when there was people living um, on Pioneer Way before we had um, immigrants into Oak Harbor, right through till um, people were wearing buttons. I didn't even notice till I was driving here, but I'm wearing shell buttons today. I mean, we, we have shell buttons today. They're fairly, a fairly common type. And these, some of these could have been made with a machine. That downing um, pattern is pretty common with a machine, but some of these were definitely handmade. So we have kind of a range. Um, okay, so in the pre-contact, so that's mostly what I'm gonna say about um, historic artifacts. I'm moving into the older artifacts now. We have basically mostly three types and also bird bone, I wouldn't wanna leave them out. But lithics are stone artifacts, mammal is a bone and shell artifacts. So mostly we have stone tools. This is a, this is a terrible picture as it turns out because that is a beautiful artifact. It's a large nephrite adze blade for woodworking. And um, this is a bone, part of a composite. You can almost see uh, this business right here. And so this would have been part of a harpoon head. Another button and a small bone awl, that would have been for sewing. So this is another familiar um, image. And again, you can see that we have three, pile three, pile 10, 58, and 77. Has the, they have the most pre-contact artifacts. 27 down here, has a, you know, we have some in here that also have a few more pre-contact artifacts, but these again were the three that showed, oh, <laughs> the most. And here's a list of the artifact types that we see, and here's the bird and fish remains that came from both all of those piles. Again, I realize this is a lot of text, but I guess the point is, is those four piles were definitely different. And there was no way to know that till after we um, screened through it all, but um, in, the <clears throat> in the analysis, it was totally apparent. So here's a, a, a number of the different types of bone artifacts that we found. These are the types over here. Uh, <clears throat> cutting, digging, bone points for hunting, uh, sea mammal hunting, scrapers, pins and pendants are ceremonial. Harpoons, so we have a fishing composite and a harpoon point. Harpoon points that were probably for sea mammal uh, hunting. Wedge for um, woodworking and sewing tool. Processing tool is a more general tool in the same way that we use a screwdriver for many things today. Um, a processing tool is uh, <coughs> sort of a multi-purpose tool. Or maybe it's our way of saying, well, we're not really exactly sure what they were doing with it. Stone tools. Um, again, wedges for woodworking, saws, drills, um, adzes for woodworking, and a braider for sharpening. Fishing, the sinker stones were for fishing. We've got lots of cutting, slicing, scoring, and some ceremonial tools. This is a real um, generalized toolkit. These are people that are doing things year round. They're process, they're hunting, they're processing, they're um, creating food and they're living their lives. This is not a specialized toolkit, it's a real general toolkit. Okay, biphases. So these are asymmetrical knives. These are generally for cutting and processing. They're a little bit bigger than some of the other tools. What this picture doesn't show is the beautiful material types. So this one here is probably from Montana or further east. This one here is from Eastern Washington. These are some really fine grained, fine tools this is a material type that you would keep and reuse over and over again until the tool was broken down so that it was too small. It's just like if you have a Mercedes, you spend a lot more time fixing it, whereas you might give up a car that has 300,000 miles on it and your mom bought it for you when you got out of college. So these are really fine tools that somebody would hang on to and use right till the very last minute. Okay, projectile points. So projectile points are my love. I'm trying not to spend too much time on them, but I wanted to show you a little bit about the chronology. Because we weren't able to get radiocarbon dates, which is our usual fallback on telling you how old a site is, you can't get a radiocarbon date unless you have exact provenience. Because we were looking at disturbed piles, even though we had carbon in there, we couldn't say where it was from. <clears throat> However, projectile points, or arrowheads, are a little bit like cars. You can look at a 57 Chevy and you can say with some certainty, wow, that's a 57 Chevy. Or a 69 Cougar. You know, there are things about cars that you can say, um, 
roughly when that comes from. Even if you're not a car enthusiast, you can look at something and know what era it comes from. Projectile points are the same way. The shape and style of a projectile point can tell you a little bit about it. So this is the most recent point that we have. And later phase marple could be up to anywhere from 500 to 1100 years old. This here is your 1100 to 1400 years old. I realize when you look at these, they just look like chunks of stone and they don't have the subtle distinctions. But I promise you that on other sites in other places, this style has been dated with radiocarbon and it's pretty accurate. Here's our central marple phase back to 2400 years. And now we're getting a little bit older. So marple to Maine, this is a, a, a projectile point style that was used for thousands of years. It's a classic. That's going to get onto a spearhead and it's going to bring you um, bring you an animal that's going to feed your family. Um, the main phase is a little bit older, so Locarno is between Marple and Maine, but these are still uh, 2,500 to 5,500 years old, these ones on the left. These are older, bigger, they would have definitely been on spears, not arrows or darts, and um, would have been used for hunting a wide variety of things. But here's our most interesting point, and actually this picture you can, can really see how beautiful the material type is. This is definitely a plains material type. And this base, uh, the style of this, is a very, very old um, point style. Uh, it's early Holocene. It predates the landform. So by that I mean this uh, point was made before the beaches around here uh, were even stable. So Pioneer Way is probably, um, it, it started to stabilize the beach that in front of there sometime after 5,000 years ago. So this point was constructed, manufactured thousands of years before that. What we think is that somebody picked it up <clears throat> and had been carrying it and loving it and when they finally lost it or broke it, it was on Pioneer Way. And in the same way that like what's in the garbage in my laundry room from all of my teenage boys when I clean out the pockets of their jeans. There's a lot of treasure in there, I'm sure, but it ends up in the garbage when I get to it. Okay, so here's the things I didn't talk to you about. We have a ton of glassware. We have a fine collection of ammunitions and firearms, dolls and other toys, automotive, tobacco pipes, military, bricks, bone and antler artifact that were historic. And we have this, this isn't the only one, we actually got a couple really cool toothbrushes that we were able to actually take these back right to the manufacturer and the, we can get an exact date because of this fine pattern right here. Um, so there is still a lot to come and I'm hoping that you'll invite me back to talk again. So um, what we've learned, Tracking a project in real time saves money. Tracking deposits in real time saves money. Um, we've also learned that even in disturbed settings, what people were doing still leaves a trace. Even on those piles, there's quite a bit of a story to tell. Um, since I've been here since 2012, I've seen that the city has completely changed how it does planning around cultural resources. And now you have a star staff archeologist to help hold and share your stories of the past. Um, he's integral to the work that we do. I'm super appreciative of him. And I wanted to say thank you to the city staff and to my crew, of course, and the state and six tribes. And I also wanted to say thank you to you guys for your leadership through a difficult time because many of you were here then. And it was hard. It was um, a huge learning curve and there, it was fraught with risk and confusion. And so I really appreciate that. And I think that's me. So you can see how we, it, I think Kelly was being very subtle in saying that the difference between what we've done before and what we've done now is we only screen four piles. That's exactly right. I track every bucket load of dirt that's coming out of the wastewater treatment plant. When we have to screen something, it's very specific. All right, should I go? <laughs> yeah. You had a diagram of piles. Yeah. Pit road. You had numbers on them. How do you preserve those piles during the wet season? So the erosion, are they all covered? Are they numbered? They were covered and numbered. So we covered them, um, originally we covered them with huge, vast, um, permeable uh, fabric for two years before I, we even got, or a whole, it was a year before we got to it. The piles were covered originally in 2011. 
when we peeled back those piles, then we covered them originally and we wood staked them. So, and we didn't take the wood stakes off until we finished right down to the base um, of each pile. And so do the piles exist now? Are they go back to piles? So that's a great question. After we screened the piles, they were moved by machine into a temporary stockpile. And then they were at the end of the project when we were completed screening everything from Pitt Road and from the city beat, the old city shop site. It all got transported to the fields behind the public works building, the public works campus, I mean, where it is still today until the reburial happens. So that pile is still there, it's still covered, and it's still behind public works. As far as it's pretty sterile of artifacts, though. I would say it's pretty sterile of artifacts. Um, visibility was difficult, and I know from all projects that I've ever done, you don't get everything. But um, how it, be, it gets managed from this point forward, I think, was discussed in, the, was that part of the settlement? Yeah, it was, and it's, it's something that I know has been worked on. Yeah. So, uh, it's no longer my responsibility. <laughs> so it must be Joe's responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> or yours truly's, actually. Yeah, I think there's a shared um, thing going on there. Yeah. It's a good segue. Um, anyway, so I'm Gideon. I already know I already introduced myself, but um, as I always tell people when I, when I do presentations, one of the most important slides is this one here. You've got my phone number and my email address. As I tell folks, be strange, not a stranger. If you want to talk about archaeology, whether that's laws or uh, traditional cultural properties or archaeology here in Oak Harbor in general, by all means, give me a call, shoot me an email, and I'm up here at Public Works and Engineering Department. A little bit about myself, I grew up in Squim, Washington. I know I look a little young, but I've got about 21 years of field experience doing archeology. span uh, Got a bachelor's from WSU and a master's from Central Washington University. I've worked for tribes and also the Department of Defense doing archeology. span I always like to show those pictures there. The top right one is Johnson Maninik. That was done by a court sketch artist when he testified at USV Oregon in 1978, one of the uh, fishing cases down on the lower Columbia River. The lower picture is of a crusher, and that's an unmanned ground vehicle. And the reason I show that is because as things change in warfare, that means that how we train soldiers is going to change, which means you have to be reactionary on how you manage the landscape. With the Yakima and the Army, you kind of have both extremes of the spectrum, essentially. So kind of uh, talking about what I did last year in 2016, I had started in May, so my first year was about seven months long. So 2016 was my first full year. Uh, I, for city projects, I assisted with 33 projects. Most of the time I monitored. So essentially what Kelly's crew does, where I watch them run a backhoe or dig a shovel or, or you name it. I tested uh, two projects. That's where I uh, dig the soil and screen it for artifacts and see if there's anything there. Both those testing projects were over at Catalina Park, by the way. Um, a lot of the work I do is during the summer, because it uh, juxtaposes a lot of the, the construction work and whatnot, but I also get out during the spring and winter some of the time. My biggest client was Parks Department with about 19 projects, and after that was water, and then uh, storm drain and wastewater. <clears throat> And then I provide comments to development services. So I look at all the development permits. Um, and most of the time, I would say use the IDP or UDP, the inadvertent discovery plan. I do that when there's any kind of ground disturbing. So whether that's in a high probability area or, or a low probability area. Um, when I recommend an archaeologist, I use uh, the SWICA Culture Resource Management Plan for Pioneer Way, which says that if it's within 60 feet of a site, you need to get an archaeologist. Uh, for monitoring, I only recommended that once, and that was for the Crescent Harbor Regatta Road realignment project. And the reason I just kind of said lightly to the county that you need to probably be prepared for an, archae or for an archaeological monitor is because it was a federal undertaking. Uh, WSDOT are overseeing the 106 process for that, but I thought I'd let them know sooner than later since they are dealing with DOT and Department of Defense. They could be a little slow at times. So other things I did, as, as Kelly mentioned earlier, uh, helping with the curation of artifacts, that upper photo there shows how they get nicely filed before they go over to the Burke Museum. 
Another one was trying to shift the boundary of 4.5 IS 4.5. That's the Pioneer Way site. And they initially had the site boundary within the Bayshore property. That's the property on the corner of Bayshore and uh, Midway. Midway, thank you. <laughs> um, and of course, we, we all know there's going to be some development going on there. Uh, uh, thick and skinny, I did the best I could, but Department of Archaeology said you're going to probably have to get an archaeologist to monitor. But the upside is at least we know up front that archaeology is going to be concerned with that, with that project. Uh, I helped the Oak Harbor Police Department with two possible finds. The, we had people call in and say they found a bone. Uh, one of those is pictured there on the lower right hand side, and that's a cow bone. And the other one was like a, a deer vertebrae. Um, but let me just say helping out the police department. I did 21 presentations uh, total, and I kind of color coded them there. So yellow is for the city folks, that light green is for public entities, the reds for government agencies, and the light blues for, for private uh, entities, I guess. Uh, I put the, made the government ones red because those are state and federal agencies. And it's kind of interesting that a city uh, staff member would teach the feds and the state on how to do tribal consultation and, and archaeology and whatnot. So forthcoming efforts. One of them is the CRMP, or Culture Resource Management Plan. Really what that is is a, a guidebook for archaeologists and also citizens and, and staff and whatnot. It, and it will be a, a public document. And uh, the gist of it is that we really don't want our citizens to wind up in a lawsuit with a tribe. In the same breath, we don't want our citizens overpaying for an archaeologist. So it's uh, dealing with a lot of the boilerplate uh, stuff that goes in a report, like an example would be the ethnographic context. That really doesn't change that much. Uh, the monitoring plan really doesn't change that much either, and the protocol for calling people. So having the DAP and the tribe sign off on a blanket one, so the contract archaeologist isn't starting over from scratch, so to speak. Um, and then in the same breath, providing guidelines so the reports are held at a higher standard. That way they could go through DAP and the tribes much more easily. The other one is developing a certified local government program, or CLG. This was established in uh, 1983 by National Park Service. Right now there's about 2,000 cities nationally that participate in it, and there's 72 here in, in Washington State. What that does, it allows a building owner uh, that has a historic building, if they wish to do so, it's, it's a voluntary program, that they could, uh, if they get a certificate of appropriation for a, uh, a rehabilitation project, they will get a break on their property taxes through the county. There's about 1,300 listed historic properties in Oak Harbor. That's a huge number. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of them aren't around anymore. So a good example would be a woodshed that had burned down and was bulldozed, but somebody went and documented it before it, it had finally got hit with a bulldozer. In addition to the tax uh, incentive, there's also grants available strictly for CLGs. Uh, the federal government sets aside about $15 million, and that gets dished out by the state. So $15 million divided by 50, and then who kind of gets what. So it is uh, very competitive, but there is grant money out there. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Some examples of maybe not the best rehabilitation projects. These are not from Oak Harbor, of course. Um, and really, it's just having the buildings match, where you have the stucco up here. and uh, Maybe what would have been better was have brick. So continue there. Um, granite here, uh, instead maybe have brick as well. This is a, a building of Victoria, BC. And again, having this new addition match this would have been maybe a, a more sound uh, addition project. There we go. Here's a, a great project that was done in Boulder, Colorado on Pearl Street. Here's the building in 2010, just lovely and uh, nicely rehabbed. <laughs> No, this is it, what it looked like in 1899. So notice the larger windows up there and also the, the larger windows here. I'm afraid to go back because I don't want it to go black on me. Here's what it looks like rehabilitated. So they rehabbed it in 2014. And there are examples of this in Washington State as well. Here's Auburn, Washington, just seems more inviting and whatnot. Um, here's one in Dayton. So again, kind of a, a worn down building. And bam, just uh, bring it back to life a little bit and make it more inviting. Uh, more open windows, putting the doors uh, inset so when someone opens up the door, not smacking somebody who's, who's uh, walking on the sidewalk. Or, uh, um, yeah, it's more inviting. This isn't quite as extreme. 
they just kind of opened up the transom windows a little bit. Those are the, the upper windows right there, just to kind of let some light in. But again, make it more inviting. And they also made a distillery as well, which, I, which makes it much more inviting, I'm sure. <laughs> this is kind of the uh, uh, one that knocks out of the park. It is rehabilitated. It's absolutely beautiful. But we see these projects as well here in Oak Harbor. Here's Laura's Mansion, otherwise known as the Onion Top House. I took this photo in 2015 when I was uh, newly hired. And here's what it looks like literally today. I took this picture today. So just, it's amazing what a little bit of paint and TLC can, can do to a building. There is deferred maintenance. I tried to take these photos so it can't be horribly obvious what buildings they are. But when you have water damage like this, it's unsightly, but then when it, it starts off as just being unsightly, but then it could add to more structural problems later on. This graph shows that, where it begins with smaller normal wear to basically the structure not being usable anymore. Here's uh, some vegetation going through awning there, and there's of course an awning that's been damaged by the wind. For CLG grants for this year, it, they range between $4,000 and $18,000. A lot of them are, f are for doing surveys, so determining how old the building is and, and what kind of rehab can be done to it, as well as interpretation, so public education, doing s more signage, plaques, and, and whatnot. I believe Anna Cordes used a CLG grant to do some plaques on 10 buildings here recently. I believe that's it. And then um, beyond that, I'd just like to uh, say that I've got plenty of information. I, I write reports each quarter, and I did have one that I sent to DAP um, in the tribes that has all this the secret information in it. But I also make one that's public, where I redact any location information and whatnot. I'm more than happy to give that to you folks. I've uh, got drafts of the Culture Resource Management Plan and CLG and other fun references and material. So um, be strange, not a stranger, like I said at the beginning. And that's it. Any questions? Input? Yes. Councilor, Sir Baby. What do you have in front of you there, Kelly? Do you get I forgot. We should hand <laughs> these around. So um, all of the artifacts from uh, the, uh, the historic artifacts from the Pit Road project um, the bulk of them, anyhow, have been sent off to um, the Burke for uh, their permanent collection. Um, but um, when we have um, dozens of examples of the same artifact or artifact type, then we are um, allowed to call them so that the Burke doesn't end up, you know, with uh, 47 of the exact same type of horseshoe. We had a lot of horseshoes on this project, but um, we submitted one of each type. And so these are some of the called artifacts, the ones that um, we already had examples of. And there's a, an interesting collection of like, um, this would be infrastructure, this is boot leather, these are beer bottles, um, bullets. Uh, this is a houseware, this is a canning top um, from a canning jar. And um, this was one of the called horseshoes. I was shocked about how many different, I think it was 17 different horseshoe types. I didn't realize that there was that many. But, uh, so um, shall I pass them around? You guys can take a look at them. Do you want to, right. we could do that or we could um, Stand hold up. on to them until uh, after. Break time? Yeah, and sure. then I can, if, if you guys want, I can box them up and yeah, take totally. them back to the office if you want. Unless you want to wait. No, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's best for you. <laughs> Next question, you used two terms in there. Um, uh, pre-contact and historic rough timelines what's considered historic versus I mean, my kids think I'm historic but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what era are we talking about we talk about pre-contact versus historic sure it's a really great question and so um, the federal law says anything older than 50 years is historic so yes Almost there. <laughs> I know it's a sad thing, <laughs> very sad thing. <laughs> but when we talk about it especially with regard to Oak Harbor we talk about um, there is isn't an exact date. We're talking about the difference between um, when we start having immigrant settlement and um, the t era prior to that. And so, like, in casual conversation, I, I, I'll say, like, 1850, 1860. We started getting, um, 1859, we're getting the border survey done in this, t in this area. And we've already got settlement. We've got certainly got the first explorations, and we've already got... Um, Gold Rush people have already well swung through here and made their mark. But as far as people settling here and building churches and schools, which is usually when you start to talk about historic activities. Um, okay. 
So it's an 1850-ish. And then pre-con pad. Uh, older than that. So uh, we include in the proto-historic period the explorer time. So anything like from 1750 <coughs> up to 1850 is a proto-historic period. That's that transition time. But prior to um, any of the European explorers making their way through here, that's pre-contact. Okay. A, a big one is the written record as well. So, of course, pre-contact, there's no written record. Historic, you're going to have writing, okay. essentially. And if I remember the numbers, you said 6,600 plus yards yep. pit road to four yards have been screened or four no, total? No, the, the comparison is if, oh. if we had a, a plan implemented um, on, the, on the Pioneer Way project, we would have had the equivalent of four pile screen versus... Four piles, not four yards. Yeah. Four piles, which were about 10 yards a piece. It would have ended up being, well, the, the truth is, is it would have been more than that. It probably would have been eight piles that we would have had to screen, so 80 yards compared to 6,600. I was just trying to compare the magnitude of, of the effort right. um, by having a, a, a good plan in place like we have on the treatment plan <coughs> versus being reactionary like we were on Pioneer Way. Okay. It still takes a lot of work to manage to track these piles. So, you know, Brett and I on the wastewater treatment plant, we're working hard to track this these piles. Like, we keep the stuff that's has a cultural component to it very separate and very well tracked, which we've been doing now for since 2014. And it is, there's still, a, you know, a commitment of resources to tracking that stuff, but it's so far less than what it would take to screen everything that comes out of here. And so the last question would be, and I'll say this as sensitively and respectfully yes. as I can, hopefully, I mean, there's a lot of people I would talk to on the street that would watch this presentation and think, are you kidding me? We're, you know, why would we, it, sound, it sounds like a, a decent chunk of what we found was modern or post-historic yes, totally. period. Yeah. And so hopefully as we move forward from a risk management perspective, we're learning as a city where to allocate those resources better and when to spend a lot more time um, not only documenting, and obviously there's a, there, there are state and federal mandates that we have to do some of this, but at some point, from a risk management standpoint, do we, I, I don't know if hedge our bets is the right term, but at what point do you spend a lot of money? Managing risk is a good way to run your um, city. Right. We haven't screened a single bucket full of material that's marginal, questionable, or we don't know where it came from. Okay. In not a bucket full. So I feel like um, it's a completely different animal at this point. Um, we, there's even disturbed deposits that we're tracking, but we're not screening because they're not associated with human remains. They're not associated with intact features or um, intact deposits. So it, it's really like night and day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, how much, uh, um, how many yards are left out at our shop that, so that has been screened? Uh, approximately six thousand yards. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, Councilman Lombard. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Kelly, and all this screening and everything like that. Did you run into any coins? Yes, we did. There's a select. Didn't I put that in my list? It's a good teaser. You want to invite me back to talk about points <laughs> <laughs> and the and the military artifacts. Well, how about the gold coins? <laughs> Didn't have any of those. If we had that many of them, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Goonies character. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I have one other question. Okay. Too, and this is for Gideon. Thanks. Uh, Gideon, out on the site, I've seen you out there at the marina, scratching around other places like. I'm going to ask this question as sensitively. You don't have to be sensitive with, with as me. As sensitively so, as yeah. I can. Do you grab the shovel once in a while when you're out there monitoring what's going on to if the guys are scooping stuff back into the trench or back there? You get your hands dirty with them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, that's one of the, I think, the appeal. I don't want to toot my own horn, but I guess I should since I'm sitting here in front of council. Uh, <laughs> that I think a lot of the appeal to, to having yours truly on site is because I, I do like to get my hands dirty. Um, a great example would be if they're lifting asphalt up. I'm not just going to watch 
somebody lift asphalt. It'll just drive me crazy. I have no problem grabbing chunks and you work throwing them in the back. You weren't out there just sipping the coffee and measuring it? Yeah, I'm not just out there drinking coffee and, and telling them where, where to dig next and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, not just, you know, as far as being help, and, and there, there have been times where I've dug and said, this is monitoring, and I'm, I'm out digging. Um, you know, I'm just another person out there. So, you know, I'm CPR trained and first aid trained if something goes wrong. Um, I've never had it happen on with a site here, um, but this time when I was working for Yakima Nation, I was monitoring an a excavator, and I just started seeing this black smoke just started shooting out of the, the engine, you know, block right out of the, out of the side, and I was like, stop, you know, and it was a gasket hat had blown. So I am another set of eyes, essentially, and, and I'm definitely a, a team player. I'll go out with some of the PW guys, too, later, and stuff like that. He's uh, jumped in for us a couple of times, which has been really um, fantastic, too. Yeah. When we had, you know, when we were doing the connector trench, mm -hmm. and we ended up into a lot more intact deposits than we planned for, it was really great having another shovel and bucket carrier. I forgot to mention that too. Yeah, I was supporting uh, during the wastewater treatment plant project. That was one of the bullets I was supposed to add. But um, especially with the human remain issues, when the, we had the first find, that was around Christmas, and nobody was around. <laughs> uh, so Friday helping. Friday afternoon yes. on December 23rd. Yeah. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so support for that. I also live here in Oak Harbor too. Um, so, you know, if I'm here on the weekend and something happens or late at night, um, you know, I'm, I'm available. And then could you define disturbed midden and intact midden? Sure. Is intact midden natural tidal uh, movement of shells and debris, or are they deposits where it became the Native Americans' um, garbage dump? So the intact um, deposits are the ones that haven't been moved since they were laid down by people. They um, are definitely laid by people. people and they haven't been disturbed. So um, in uh, City Beach Street, we have a ton of infrastructure projects. So we have a lot of cultural deposits, archeological deposits that have been moved in the past um, 70 years by you know, the laying of power lines or water lines or sewer lines. So that gets disturbed and mixed around. We treat that one way. But those deposits that haven't been moved around that are still laying exactly the same way as they were laid down there 1140 years ago, um, those ones we treat differently. And they're the ones that we try to take some time and care with. And um, we try to avoid them, we try to plan for them, but when we hit them and it's an unanticipated um, discovery, uh, it's great when we have more people and more resources and we can jump on that and make that happen quickly so that we're not affecting schedule of the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I might add that we did find undisturbed men underneath one of our slabs. It was underneath the concrete slab and I had building it. That concrete slab had protected it. Protected it, so yeah. it's something we could never, as much exploration we then we would, wouldn't have torn that up until the last one. Okay, thank you, uh, good report, and I can, I can uh, attest that uh, Gideon had a shovel in his hand at the uh, gazebo move down oh, by the marina right. not too long ago. Yeah. I saw him down there. So. Yeah, I did the uh, field work and knocked out a report the following day, which is not too common for our geologists to do. Yeah. Nice job. Good report. Thank you very much. Um, I think at this time, then, we'll move on to item number 1B, Clean Water Facility Interpretive Center. Is that uh, yours? It uh, is. Joe? Um, so we've been working on the, the clean water facility for quite some time and uh, an integral part of that since the, the conception has been an interpretive center and it's been included uh, since the get-go and so um, it's really important to satisfy the city's needs we have several permits whether it's um, for a water system uh, sewer solid waste all these different programs that we have, and there's storm drain, that there's permit requirements associated with them that we're required to provide education. We have funding set aside to provide that education in those different utilities. So we thought, what a better way of doing this than to include a space uh, where we can be more efficient about it. And, um, and that's what we've done on that, that premier corner that we've looked at for so long. So to make best use of that space, we brought on uh, Chuck Lennox here. 
to help us with that, uh, to, to come up with the best way to lay out um, the floor plan and what's the best uh, uh, direction we want to go with that. How do we want, what do we want people to feel like when they leave? What do we want them to do? And if I say too much more, I'm probably going to steal this thunder. But um, with that, I'll hand it over to, to Chuck and let him. Just before we do that, we'll also uh, welcome our, our Director of Public oh, Works, Kathy you. Rosen, to our table. Thank here. you. Okay, Chuck. Thanks. Uh, just a little bit about me and my background. Uh, I have my own consulting firm called Lennox Insights. I and S I T E S, little play on words. And pretty much my background is what I would call working on Rama visitor experience. So helping clients to help the, the visitor or even the customer understand the messages they want to deliver in a variety of ways. It could be training of employees, it could be uh, medium development interpretive signs, and it also could be looking at the planning of a, of a facility like this. And I will have to say I really want to compliment the city on doing this because increasingly uh, wastewater treatment, or in this case, and I love the name clean water facility, I think that's very, a great positive way of looking at things, is it's closed up, you can't see it uh, for security reasons. And this is an opportunity for the public to gain a little bit of an insight into what they pay for and a chance for students and children growing up in the community understanding what's that building down there, what's happening. And this is just an excellent way of, of trying to do this. And the other aspect of this, and there's just a few of these slides that you all are familiar with, is this is in a location that's very rare. If you look at other wastewater treatment plants, you have to drive there. You have to get kids in a school bus you have to make a pur purposeful journey to get there. This, will be lo this is in Windjammer Park. You can get that casual visitor out walking a dog and wondering, what's in that building? And here's a, a visitor center where they can understand that. You'll have that person who wouldn't drive to a place to begin to understand their role in keeping water clean. So it's a great location that way. One of the things that we discovered is it's only 1,500 square feet. And if you've ever visited Brightwater Education Center with King County, that main room, not, not the meeting room or anything, but that main room where the exhibits are, it's about that same size. So it's not really big, but, uh, not very big at all. But um, with this opportunity of, of having people dropping in, we also have that opportunity around the facility itself where there's windows that are placed where people, even if this building isn't open, where they can look in and see the operations that way. And we've taken a look at figuring out how that might work as you're looking without a person there, uh, looking in that window and what would happen. So color coding things, making uh, signage outside the window to looking in. So 24-7 people could have a little bit of an understanding through four windows looking into the plant itself. Um, one of the things that we've also talked about, I just I brought this up with, with staff, is the name interpretive, and I've had this happen my entire career, the next word is what language do you speak? And so there's a lot of confusion around that word. And one of the things we've been toying with is calling this the water center. Because we're looking at water in a very different way. We're looking at water where it comes from, how it's clean. And also, you've got a connection to Puget Sound right there. So it's just something that we've been kind of toying with, that idea. So I just wanted to give you a sense of the kind of work that we've done already on this. We've talked to a lot of other people on the island. I've, I've interviewed a lot of different folks who are involved with everything from conservation education to water. We've made some great inroads. The Conservation District, for instance, is very excited about this happening. And one of the things that they've talked about is their willingness to install a rain garden in the park. Uh, they even have an interpretive sign they, they would be willing to, uh, to give to the city. So there's a lot of potential cooperation with other things happening on, on the island. And we did this to make sure we weren't duplicating things uh, exhibit-wise. So there's a lot of other stories told on the island about native plants, about um, ecosystems. Uh, and the like, but this really, this particular center will tell more of that unique water, just specifically water story itself. So you can see here we've gotten a lot of different viewpoints. One of the things that just happened last week that these guys don't know about yet is I got in touch with the school district and their director of teaching and learning and had a discussion with him about schools using the center itself. And the one thing he mentioned, which I'm really excited about, is the fact that they have at least four to five elementary schools that students could walk to this place. So he used the term walking field trips, which is a great idea because if you've ever had kids in school and have to raise funds for field trips and then give up parent volunteers, this would be a great opportunity to connect the schools in. And one of the things we've talked about is the need for when these exhibits go in is to make sure that they're aligned 
with next generation science standards. Because in schools today, you can't add one more thing for them to do. It would align with what they're doing already, and this would be an actual hands-on experience for students to understand what's happening once they've read about it or studied it in school. Um, a little bit of just what's important in a, in a project like this is to look at what are your goals. And one of the things we've done here is to break them up into three different things. What we want them to know, what they want them to feel, and what they want them to do. A lot of times these centers, we want this stuff happening. We want them to know all this stuff. But in many ways, the first way to really connect to a visitor is emotionally and, and through here and, and get them excited, get them interested. And then we want them to think about it, but then we also want them to do some things. So as you can see here, we've looked at, uh, we want them to know what their role is in, in uh, being a good water steward. And keep in mind these goals, usually goals are these really big, big, broad ideas. And then specifically we get into more details once the center gets um, further along. Uh, how wastewater is clean and why that's important. And then also how the water is connected to Puget Sound, which is going to be right out the front door, and the, um, how the, uh, the city itself is connected to Puget Sound. And then afterwards, feeling a stronger connection to the waterfront, and also just a sense of pride. Uh, I, this is just an incredible project for coming into the city and not knowing about this project, to get the sense of pride that staff have in building this plant. And you should be very proud of this as a community this size to have this kind of a facility going in. It's, it's really, really neat. Um, and then do is just engage more with the city in terms of the kinds of things we uh, would like them to do, either at personal practices or in their yard or even in their community that way. A theme is an idea is basically that kind of what is the story about this center. And this is the theme statement that we've come up with, that water, an essential element for life, is a precious commodity to use, conserve, protect, and provide that links generations and cultures on Whidbey Island. And when you think back to the previous presentations, Native Americans were here because of water. The military's here because of the way it is. So having that kind of understanding is going to be important as people leave. And again, thinking about this in really broad general terms, it includes more than just the, the wastewater part of it, but also how we protect that and where we get that water from. I know this is a lot of words, but just briefly, these are some, we've, we've broken them up into three categories. This would be the history and culture theme. And this would be envisioned as, as one, maybe four-sided exhibit. And not in great detail, because these stories can also be told elsewhere, are being told elsewhere in the community. But just kind of talking about uh, Windjammer Park itself, the, uh, how Euro-Americans were attracted to this area, as well as Native Americans, and also including the Gary Oak and the features that way, as well as the military. So not a major emphasis on each of these, but kind of a general introduction to the history and the culture of this site and why that's important. One of the things that happened with this is there's so many stories that staff wanted to tell in the building that we started to look at that ability to use the park outside as another way to tell stories. So think about, for instance, actions we might want citizens to take around stormwater. What a better place to tell it than right out the front door, mentioning this is some ideas inside the center, and then sending people out to actually see it in action. So tying the two together rather than having it be separate that way. And the same thing would be told about Native American stories, introducing that presence that was here, and then encouraging them to go outside and, and look at this beach and understanding why this was used by Native Americans many, many, many years ago. This is even longer, Liz, but just real briefly, um, one of the things, this would just be telling the story of the wastewater plant, what happens with it, the different processes that way. It's a complex story, would want to tell it in a way that's pretty simple, and these are some just different elements that's there. I realize this is a lot of words, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that we were doing our homework, so to speak. And last but not least, these are practices that we want people to take on in the community. Not all of these would be interpreted or told every, in every exhibit. Um, these are actually practices that have been connected around Puget Sound through the Puget Sound Water Quality Authority. I, I, I know probably which one you yeah. are laughing at, yeah. the second bullet. Yes. <laughs> what was funny about that, you, think, you look at that and you think, oh my goodness, Wright Water Center has found that is the most effective things that kids will remember after they leave the center. Yeah. Yeah. In those words, and using those words kind of thing. And it's one of those things where sometimes you have to take a little bit of a risk, but that's the one, and, and what better way 
to extend the life of the plant than having kids remember that, that element that comes into play. Because these guys have told me lots of stories about the things that come through wastewater. And that may even be one of those exhibits that we have. Actually, I think Brightwater is thinking about that as exhibiting the kinds of things that they find in an actual exhibit that way. But these are, um, we didn't just pick these willy-nilly. These are actually pro um, most urban areas, most, most cities and towns around Puget Sound. These are the uh, practices that the Puget Sound, uh, I want to say action team, and that's not the, yeah, and that they have actually documented will make a difference in the, in the quality of Puget Sound that way. So one of the concepts would be maybe there's a practice of the month that we encourage people to be involved in, in an exhibit, and that might change. And then tying that into maybe there's a, an International Water Day, for instance, tying those kinds of things in. So these are some elements that we would want people to, to look at. We're also looking at that aspect of recycling and other components that way that would um, help improve water quality in the, in, the, in the bigger picture. Just a little bit briefly, this is the footprint itself. You would enter in here. That's that ramp. And this would be um, coming into the actual facility and through here. One of the ideas that we've come up with, and of course, we're at just at the idea stage. We're kind of at the brainstorming thing. Is, is it possible, for instance, for this front door to actually be made from the Gary Oak? You know, is, that, is there enough wood? Is it strong enough? Is it smooth and thick kind of thing? The other idea would be here is probably a front desk uh, that would be you know, an area where brochures would be available. We, there'd be a, someone greeting people. Um, one of the elements that we found at the Lot Center down in Olympia, which some of you may have visited, is they now have an electronic check-in where people will actually, they'll ask people to just kind of leave their name uh, in a, with an email voluntarily. They're able to track visitors that way, the number of people in the party. And then they capture that email voluntarily and are able to have a mailing list and a connection with, with their residents or their visitors, many of them residents, um, to extend the visitor experience that way. Um, looking along kind of an introduction to the, to the park and the center and orientation that way, this area, for instance, would be potentially a um, children's play area. One of the things that Lot left out of their original planning was this agent below, <laughs> site-wise that a lot of times older children are fine in the center like that with their parents. Younger children are bored to death, and so having something that they can physically um, play on related to water. These are, of course, big windows looking out towards the sound, and one of the things we've talked about here is having an area, I, I think of it as being the living room, where parents can sit, or any visitor can sit in chairs, potentially spotting scope, binoculars, looking out the window, having that uh, just a really different kind of an experience that way of uh, some very beautiful views. This is the lab, and there's a window that looks through the lab. So we'd want to tell the story of, um, as these guys call the bugs, how the plant actually works and cleans water that way. One of the other ideas we've had here is on this wall, telling the story of careers and what it takes to run a center like that, how, if you were interested in that, you could become um, you know, part of the operation. At Brightwater, they mentioned that, that up to 30 to 40 percent of current operators, current uh, staff in wastewater treatment plants will retire in the next five to ten years. So that a sense of trying to recruit. The other thing that I don't think I shared with these guys is the possibility of doing like an outreach day where the Skagit Valley uh, College has people with a display in the background and just talks about their jobs and extends invitations to come visit and learn more about what the possibilities are. This is the conference room and one of the things we've talked about in there is the idea of having a changeable display space. So the community, if with photographs, things that would be related to the theme of the center, could be photographs of wildflowers, could be pictures with a water theme, but changing space so that you could alternate it um, uh, over, the, over the months and involve community more. This, of course, is a meeting space, but it also could be a classroom space for master gardeners and the like. In the middle, uh, kind of in the middle of the room here, in three different places, would be the larger display areas, probably four-sided. And one of the thoughts I had is having it be movable. You wouldn't see it. You'd have to lift up flaps and, and unlock a wheel and be able to move them around so it'd be a little bit more flexible of a space that way. But basically covering those three themes we talked about, how the plant works, history and culture, and then personal practices that way. This area here would be kind of a staging area for the tours that would go out of the plant that would be in this direction here. The restroom, even talking about the features that are in that restroom that you could have at home, low flow toilets, aerators on the faucets, 
those kinds of things in a very subtle way. You don't necessarily want to have a billboard, but in subtle ways talking about those kinds of elements that come into play. And then over in this corner, looking at um, a video area where people could sit. One of the most popular things at Brightwater are these very short videos. One of the ideas we came up with, which would be several years into the future, but doing things like a video contest with high school students in the area around messaging around clean water and having the winners be able to be available and shown in that area. So, um, Anything else that you guys want to add? I think you covered most of <laughs> yeah, it. For I, me. I would just want to point out that, that there is an operable, movable oh, right. partition wall so that we could open up that conference center and make it part of the, the display area. As well, so. And the idea with a temporary area is if there's a meeting in there and it's closed, people haven't missed any meeting messages in that respect. And there's really not a tremendous amount of wall space there, but enough to, to be able to have some kind of variety to highlight. Like, so. I want to emphasize that the Interpretive Center isn't just in, inside the stream, you mentioned it, but it's, it's extended out into the park and, and around the entire facility as well. So this is, this is a place to kind of kick it off mm -hmm. and go mm -hmm. find more information. Mm -hmm. But we'll, this will be scattered around the park in key locations to educate people. One of the things with this, I, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because so often we'll ask people to do things, install a rain garden. So what does that look like? Or, oh, it's going to look really bad because it's going to be plumped down. They'll be able to go into the park and they probably won't even recognize the rain garden unless there's a sign that says this is what that is. And so to integrate those different pieces and have it be a real, uh, ability to really see what we're talking about ha has great opportunities for people to adapt it themselves. That sense of what does that really look like, what does it take, and there it is, uh, really helps people to, to, to feel like they can do it themselves too. Councilor Munn? Is it possible to get a copy of that file digitally, or is it just way too big? I mean, you had a lot of writing. I would like to be able to digest some oh. of that writing. So yeah, I think really. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. You've you so got the PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Sturbaby. Thank you. You've got in here noted on the west and south side a water feature. Do we still have, and I know in early drawings we saw something that either meandered or was a straight line feature on the west side all the way down to a possible splash park area. Do we still have that being incorporated? It would, it would actually start where it says water feature on here and go off to the right, which is towards the waterfront, mm -hmm. and parallel that the promenade that's shown on other plans. We still have that. Okay. That's still Theme that's still, still falling. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You know that reminds me, if I can, um, the plaza that's right out front here. One of the things that'll be really great is again groups of people who may not even know the center is there, and then interchange and interaction. But the opportunity to do water-related events and, and connect the center to the to what's happening out on the plaza is really a, a great way to bring in more people and extend messages. So. Other questions? Input. Uh, you talked about a ramp up. Uh, what is the elevation then? It's fourteen five. That it's. Well, it needs to have accessibility, and it's the ramp. I believe is going to be over the water feature as well, to kind of be mm -hmm. part of the entrance. Mm -hmm. Dynamic, you know, that you get to. And, and what did you say, Brad? For yeah, the floor elevation is fourteen five, so you got to have a, a wheelchair accessible ramp. Okay. Wax stairs and other parts of it, but we have to make it accessible. Sure. Is okay. there an ADA route? And then, uh, what is, you said 1,500 feet, did I hear? 1,500 square feet. 1,500, okay. Not, not so, real big. <laughs> yeah, it's not real big. So uh, as far as size of a meeting would be roughly the, what? Did you say like 30? I think there are about 30 people at max. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're not, um, at this point, we're not necessarily anticipating using the interpretive center itself to host large events. There is the classroom where you can, you know, be decent size, maybe similar to what we have out at Public Works, maybe a little bit bigger, I'm not sure, but right in that same same area. You know, the, the displays and stuff will be movable, but the convenience of doing that and switching around, uh, we haven't really allowed, I mean, there's just enough storage in there. We're trying to figure out how we're gonna get chairs and stuff in that storage closet as is. 
and I'm glad you mentioned that one of the things we did have talked to the architects about is with those exhibit areas, we're going to have to make sure that wiring is in floor because one of the elements that we want to have in the exhibit is the ability for, for the visitor, especially students, to be able to trace where their water comes and where it goes. So here's my house, and how does, that, how does the sewage get from my house to the plant, or from the school to the plant? And literally being able to press a button and see the route that comes to it. Yeah, and you know, I'm trying to work on something else that, you know, you, we've all been on tours of treatment plants or facilities like that, and it can be confusing. You, you know, you find yourself in a spot and you see, you know, our, you know, <laughs> WAS and RAS and, you know, all these different acronyms that are shown. I'm, I'm really pushing to get a, a theme put together so that you can see, maybe even out front or a display inside, what the flow is through the treatment plant and use the common color themes and then as you go on a tour of the plant those same colors reappear as you move your go through the plant so it's a little bit easier to follow where you are in the treatment process it's it's really exciting and you know fr frankly it's probably takes somebody three or four times walking <coughs> through the plant to actually pull it all together but um, i think it's an important part of the education facility a big part of this is knowing who your audience is uh, students are one audience in terms of, and even with that, you've got different levels. But you will also have people who are really technical, who want to understand the inside of it. But that's only about 5% of probably who will come by. And that average person, there's a certain amount of information you want to make sure that they have, but you have to also be careful about words and what you use, because all of a sudden, you know, that fog comes over them. That way, so. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very Just much. Just one last quick slide here. One of the things I think is important, as I mentioned, is to hit people emotionally. And the use of quotes, something like this at the entrance, will just give, help to set that scene as to what to expect inside. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've, uh, we're now moving to uh, pending agenda items. 2A, we'll start with our Marina proposed rate increase presentation. I see some marina people coming here and development services. I'll let you introduce yourselves and remind you we've got 45 minutes left in our meeting here. So, Hello, Mayor, Council. I'm, I'm Chris Sublett. I'm the Harbor Master here at the Oak Harbor Marina. And Steve Powers, Director of Development Services. I'd also like to add that we have Ken Hewlett. He's the Chairman of the Marine Advisory Committee with us as well today. So. What we're here to talk to you about today is on the March 7th City Council agenda. There's going to be an agenda bill to um, change the master fee schedule, Section D, which is the marina rates. So we thought today we would go over the, some history of the marina, what the marina is, and then a few of the, the rate changes that we're proposing. So just a reminder, the marina is about 423 slips. We have all different sizes, covered and uncovered. We also have storage sheds. We have dry storage, and we use about six acres of space out there. We are an enterprise fund. So this means that we are self-supported. Uh, our real workhorses are the, the moorage, the sheds, and our fuel. And it's important to note that we don't receive any taxpayer funds to operate and run the marina. We are open to the public, and, and I like to say there's a million things to do down there. We have lots of events, clubs, there's lots of nature down there, and, and photography is a big thing down there. We always have people down there taking some really nice pictures. We do have some reserves. Uh, we have about three months' worth of operating expenses. We have a bond reserve because we do have a bond on some improvements we did several years ago. We have an equipment rental reserve, and then we have a small amount for capital improvements. So how do we get to, to the prices that I'm about to share with you? We surveyed a bunch of marinas in the area, the, the ones that are closest to us. We also included Des Moines Marina, which is the only other city-owned marina in the state. We took their prices and then came up with an average. We then looked at our current rates and compared it to the average, and, and we found that we're far below those averages. We found that um, in many cases, we're up to 20 or 30 percent below some of those averages. So there was there was a huge difference. So our proposed rates are, are slightly lower than most of the averages, but there are a few that are just about at the average or, or just above the average. 
Some of the things you have to consider when we're raising rates is not only the marina and the service that we provide that's similar to the other marinas, but what's around the marina, what's the amenities. Some marinas you can walk into town, you can walk to a restaurant, everything's right there. Unfortunately, um, we are close to town, but we don't have those amenities right at our marina. We're also not very close to the prime cruising areas, the San Juan Islands. So those are some considerations we took into thought. We did meet with the Marine Advisory Committee three times to, to discuss these increases. They did discuss and review all the proposed rates and, and they do support this rate increase. And it should be noted too that it's been about five years since we had a, a rate increase down at the marina. So one of the big workhorses of the marina is the mortgage rate. And we're proposing a 3% increase on the mortgage rate. Just to uh, inform you, the mortgage bill consists of many things. You have the mortgage rate, you have the dredge fee, you have environmental compliance, and then you have tax on some of those items. So this is specifically just on that mortgage piece. We're also proposing a $5 or an increase to $5 on our environmental compliance fee. Uh, the cost of recycling, the cost of oil absorbance, and keeping the environment clean has is, is gone up substantially over the past few years. Uh, one thing to note is the small boat contract is not affected in the mortgage piece. That's the $55 per month uh, contract that we have. It is affected in the environmental compliance fee, but you'll see in the, in the charts that you have that the price still remains at $55. So we actually scaled the mortgage backwards on that one. The storage sheds, currently they're at $106.64 per month and we're proposing that they go up to $130. The dry storage, that's the boats parked along the fence line on the outskirts of the parking lot, going from $50.72 to $52.24. One of the, the main attractants at the marina is the fuel, the diesel and gas sales. We, we offer some of the lowest priced fuel in this area, if not the entire Puget Sound. Our markup currently is 40 cents a gallon on the fuel. So we're looking to increase that to 50 cents a gallon uh, for both gas and diesel. And we'll still offer the same discounts. You're gonna get a nickel off for over 100 gallons and 20 cents a gallon off if you stay the night with us up to the amount you pay. We feel that those increases there are still gonna keep us lower. When we look at the surveys like the Fine Edge, with increasing it by a dime, we see that we're still gonna be substantially lower and still attract many people to the marina. Guest mortgage, uh, we do get a lot of guests here and we, we have two guest mortgage prices. One is in the summer and that's 89 cents a foot and one is in the winter and it's 69 foot. And what we're proposing is to increase that up to a dollar a foot year round. We found that in the winter time, people come, they stop by, for weather, for fuel. It's not really the same summer customer, so we believe that increasing that up to a dollar is not gonna have an effect on our, our guest mortgage in the winter or even in the summer. We also charge for guest mortgage electricity and that's gonna go from $3 to $4 per night. Some of the miscellaneous items, and there's many, many fees at the marina. Uh, the liveaboard fee, we're proposing to increase that to 6180. Our gate cards are currently $5 plus tax. We're going to try and raise those to $10 plus tax. We found that we're actually losing money on the gate cards. When you consider the cost of them, the gate maintenance, the programming, we're, we're on the wrong end of that. Our hourly labor rate, we found that to be um, way low, going from $46.30 an hour to $75 an hour. And that's when a, a marina person has to repair something, for example, at the marina that was, that was broken by a, a marina user, a, a post, a roof structure, that sort of thing. And then our late charges, uh, we're proposing to raise them to 3%. So those are really some of the big changes that, that we're looking at. Chris, you have any, hmm? is the gate card, is that an annual? No, Five. no, you purchase it once and it's yours for the, the lifetime um, that you're in the marina. And in fact, we have many people that just come in in the summer and they keep that in their boat and when they come back, we just turn it back on. And that's a free service. But if you lose the card, then you have to pay to get mm -hmm. replaced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Comes yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Go back on the slides. Wait. 
the reverse one. Okay, gas electricity. Mm -hmm. What's is that four dollars a foot or? No, $3 that's $3 per night. Three dollars per night. That's so. Five for the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Councilor Survey. Thank you. You mentioned it had been about five years since we've done a mm -hmm. increase, mm -hmm. and we struggle with this same concept with property tax and the mm -hmm. consequences of uh, Initiative 747, I think it was. Is there any reason we don't have an annual a policy that we do something that's commensurate with inflation to try and so people don't get the sticker shock, even though these aren't uh, tremendous rate increases? Why wouldn't we just annually try and do something that will keep pace? It's something that the Marine Advisory Committee and we've talked about each year. Over the, the past several years, the boating industry has really suffered, and our occupancy level has gone really down. So by not increasing the rates over that time, we've really been able to build our occupancy rate level back up. But now we're at a point where we do need to raise those rates to keep up with the operation budget. The Marine Advisory Committee has said at the last meeting that they want to look at this each year with a serious eye moving forward. Thank you. Last rate increase we put into effect, we did for three years. Uh, council took one action that was going to go for three years. Uh, first year was fine, and, and when it came time for the second year, that's when the, the bottom had dropped out sort of on everything. Um, and so uh, Marine Advisory Committee was really concerned about that. We came back to the council and, and asked you to reconsider that, and, and you did. Um, and so we were sort of thinking along the lines, let's have a a known increase for a period of three years there'd be surety for our customers and then the economy went sideways on us so it's, it's encouraging to see the committee wants to do it on an annual basis okay. yes well, I, I had a question about your uh, um, your electrical you don't you don't have a lot of the extra what is it 50 amp is that is that right we only have 150 amp um, power pedestal in the whole marina. So those boats that need 50 amp power, there's actually a device they can use to plug into two outlets which will scale it down to 50 amps. In that case that person would pay um, eight dollars per night because they're using actually double the amount of electricity that we would anticipate. But when you compared your uh, fees with the other marinas, did you take that into consideration or, or should we? Should. I mean if I guess there's a way they can get it. They just pay it and it works. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Most of our power pedestals have meters on them. So we read those each month for our, our standard tenants and we know how much they've used and then we charge them accordingly. Okay. Councilor Omberg. On your, on the liveaboard fee, mm -hmm. is 6180, is that a month or a one time fee? That's a month. It is a month. Yeah, yeah. So that covers their electrical too? No, that covers basically water, sewer, garbage, those sorts of things. Okay, and then they pay by the foot too. Correct? Yeah, yeah. They pay the regular mortgage fees. And then, and then the, the power for them, mm -hmm. is that a daily rate or you have a meter? No, they, they have a meter okay. in most cases or they may be in a flat rate section. Department of Natural Resources. I know it's getting kind of close to the cutoff. I checked the website yesterday, um, and it shows that how, or, yeah, House, yeah, House Bill 1801 has gone to the Appropriations Committee, um, and that's as far as I can tell based on what the website is showing me. And I think we learned when we were in Olympia that 5504 uh, died on the vine. Okay, yeah. and then um, just to follow up on that, that lease is due to end, did you say in 2018 or 19? 19. 19. 19. So we have a, another year, couple years. Um, and this may be a bigger question maybe for like a workshop or I know you know when we have more time, but I'd like to know maybe staff's thoughts on what, what, are, what are you planning for that lease and what the options are you know, as we get closer to it, maybe just a more bigger picture discussion on, on the future and what's gonna happen with, with that lease. And it's just, just something I've thought of, especially since we talked so much about it in Olympia. And, Discussion for another time, a longer discussion, but it's certainly something I've thought about in the future, the big future of the marina. It's a good topic. We need to have a plan B. Mm -hmm. yeah. there questions? Input? Okay. Thank you Next for that. Uh, Thank you. We'll move on to item number 2B, Resolution 1703, 2017 Annual Comprehensive Plan Amendments Docket. Development services. So I see 
Our senior planner, Kat Kamak, has joined us. Thank you, members of the council, mayor. Um, so this is just a pending agenda item update, annual comprehensive plan amendment. This is something that we do, we have done annually, except for last year where we did the 2016 major update in June. State law says you can amend your comprehensive plan only once a year, so we did that last year. But before that, for many years, we've been doing these comp plan amendments every year, and so this year we've started it back up again. And the process starts in October of the previous year, and we start to compile the items we want to address the following year. Um, so uh, the Planning Commission held a hearing on it, and the City Council was supposed to consider it in March, and the um, agenda bill that is in your packet has the items that are going to be considered for 2017, and I'll quickly run through them. We're going to update the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Plan. Our plan, uh, we adopted it back in 2009, yeah. and um, that plan is valid for us. It's not expired till we do another update or we say that this plan is expired. But for the state and for their grant, they need the plan to be updated every six years in order to qualify for their grant. So it's good to do the update. So we're going to do the update this year, and then we'll be eligible again for grants that parks can use uh, throughout the year. So that's one thing that we want to do. Capital improvements plan, that's something that we have on the list every year. We don't have to amend it every year, but usually there are some schedule changes and some cost increases or decreases based on what decisions have been made. So we leave that open and on the docket so that we can change it if we want to. Uh, the environmental element, uh, this is uh, something that ne needed to be done as part of the 2016 update, and we got a 12-month extension from the state on that uh, to update it. We needed some additional information and some work with the state on that, and so we'll be doing that, and that will come forward this year as well. Um, economic development element, this is something that, again, is one of those elements we've kind of left open on the docket. We're, uh, uh, there was some uh, movement uh, last year, towards the middle end of last year, to get a group of people together to kind of look at Okavar's economy and see if it, if more things could be done to keep it more uh, sustainable and vibrant. And uh, we just left it open just in case uh, there were some policy changes that needed to be considered that needed to be added in the, in, in the comprehensive plan. So. That is the docket that's coming forward to the City Council uh, in March. And, uh, you know, I've listed the criteria and so uh, whatnot on the agenda bill, and nothing jumps out, at, out of the ordinary, so everything should be good moving forward. So I uh, just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that, and if you have any questions or issues, I can address them now and, or make changes as, uh, uh, as we move this to the Council meeting on, in March. Uh, which uh, council meeting do you plan? The seventh. Oh, first, the first one. First one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Input? Anyone? You must have pretty thoroughly covered it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Mr. Kamak. We'll move on to item number 2C, third amendment to the professional services agreement with the Architectural Elements, LLC. Yep. So this is me. Uh, this is uh, as uh, representing the Arts Commission and their work uh, related to the autumn leaves. Um, I'll just uh, kind of pass these around just for to help your memory. This is the project that's uh, proposed to be located on the corner of Fourth and Highway 20. Um, this is the contract that we amended actually last. We did two amendments in the last two months. So you should be familiar with it. One amendment was to um, uh, push the date out for another year because the steel pipes, and I have some exhibits, the steel pipes that they're using for the, for the lines, that's a pretty thick pipe, and they couldn't find a really good place to bend it in so many different ways. So these metal pipes are bent um, not only in, just in curves, but they're also bent in, in, as a whole in, uh, and I have some pictures here, and I'll pass them around for you. So the first amendment was to move the timeline. The second amendment was these things are heavy, the metal, and the leaves are, if you can imagine, they're going to be about five to six feet long. So they're all metal, and they're all going to be heavy. 
So the building department was like, well, we need some engineering on foundations for this. And so initially when we uh, came up with the scope of the project, we did not anticipate the building division requiring engineering services on this. So we came back for a contract amendment to get engineering services done. So that was the second amendment. Um, the Art, Arts Commission formed a subcommittee to go look at this work, and I have some pictures of this, and I'll just pass them around as I'm talking about this. <coughs> so, the, uh, this is the workshop in Bellingham Architectural Elements. Uh, it's a big space, and uh, the project, as you can see, is pretty large in scale. It's about 45 feet long by 15 to 18 feet in height. And, um, so one of the things that came up, and I'm going to bring some exhibits back here. So this is the this is the pipe. This thing is heavy, just this section. But this is the size of the pipe that they were bending. That they needed more time. And so if you see that initial um, graphic that has the leaves in it, you can see that the veins on the leaf have little slits on them. And um, when we came close to them making the leaves, they found out for the scale of the leaves and the slit that you make in there, it could be a safety hazard. This is, if you look at that, you know, people, are, people could climb on it very easily. We don't want people to climb on it. We'll put signs up, try to prevent them, but we can't keep them from climbing it if they want to. And if they climb and if something happens, there's still possibility for all kinds of risks. So we told them from the very beginning that we want this to be as safe as possible. We can't eliminate every safety issue, but we'll identify the ones that we can, we can manage. So these slits ended up being quite a safety hazard because fingers would fit in very easily, and wherever they, they there are sharp edges, wherever the veins kind of split off. And that was not a good option. So we asked them to look at other options. And so the first option they came up with is this. Um, just to have the veins welded on to the leaf. And the Arts Commission took a look at it and they're like, well, it's not as intricate as that. It's not as transparent as that. They were hoping for that lightness, even though this is metal. And this became a little bulky, so they said, we like the lightness and the transparency of that. Can you guys come up with some other alternative for the leaf? And so they did. And I have another example of that. So they came up with this. And they went off the idea of the transparency, so they found a perforated metal. And they got the idea, and they knew that the Arts Commission wanted this to be a little more intricate than the welding. And so they cut the metal out, and then, of course, because it's a perforated metal, they put the edge on this as well. And the Arts Commission went and took a look at the site. They took the piece, and they put it against the, the pipe, and they loved it. This is what they uh, think is more artistic than the welding on on this piece. Um, you can see how this leaf is bent. Well, they'll do the same thing with this. So as you can see, you know, light will go through this, but when it's bent, you'll see light go through some portions of it, and it'll be blocked in some portions of it. And it makes it even more interesting when you drive by it, because then the lighting will change as these leaves are bent. So overall, they thought that this would make a little dynamic bring a dynamic element to it and still keep things light. So they said, we love it. Well, the architectural element said, great. Well, but guess what? It's going to cost more. And so they sent us a change order. I just have a copy of this. This will be in your agenda bill when it comes forward. And the, the reason is because there's more cuts to, to this than the original uh, piece. So um, the Arts Commission took a look at it, and they discussed it. 
heavily for a while and since they liked it over the other piece and since it's going to be a signature piece coming into a carver they really liked the uh, the second option and so therefore they recommended to the city council that the change order be accepted and the uh, contract amended so that's their recommendation as it stands so i'm going to bring it forward to city council uh, as a as a agenda item um, in March, so I thought we'll talk about it here, and if the city council has questions or concerns, then we can try and address those uh, as we move this forward. Councilor Munz? Um, is there still money in the budget for this piece? Yes, so okay. my agenda bill has some information on fiscal impacts. It, uh, oh, don't have the agenda bill? No. Oops, sorry. Uh, we had it in the so, workshop packet. It's under architectural third amendment to the professional services agreement with architectural elements. This is the paper that you have to pay. I think the, the packet was emailed out, though, I believe. This Glenn pack? Yes. Okay, yes. got it. No. Okay. Yeah, I get. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Campbell. <laughs> 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 you didn't do that. It has to have been in a first they I'm sent not, out an updated one. Yeah, I updated one for but it's not in the it? Okay. I got it. Page 38. Here. Here. Mayor, do you have, I, I have a paper card. You know, uh, I think I've got it. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so to answer your question on uh, the funds, the Arts Commission does have funds to cover it. Uh, it has funds to cover the remaining expenses that need to be paid for the sculpture and to accommodate the cost increase. Um, and then it will have some left over as well. One other question. So I see how the leaves are fixed. So will both sides be colored? Both will be patina. So you won't patina? have the same texture. There, there is a front and back for this. Okay. So this will be the front. The back will have the same patina okay. as as the front. Okay. This is not finished. But this it's not going to have the veins. Okay. It's not going right. to have the veins. But it'll be top part that's bent towards? Towards the street. Okay, got it. Thank you. And what is the new total? I, I'm still not finding it. Uh, 54,375. Okay. The original was about 4,200 and something. 42,000, sorry, uh, 563. The engineering services, which was the second amendment, was for $3,200, and this one is for $8,612, uh, bringing the total to $54,375. And I have some information, if you have the uh, uh, agenda bill uh, in front of you, the statements below kind of give a status of the uh, Arts Commission Fund. And after paying all of the the costs on this, I think we will still have approximately twenty seven thousand dollars left in the fund. So it's still a healthy balance and, mm -hmm. and they have other projects that are moving forward as well. So Okay. Other questions? Yes. The Tina is it's a type of coding. Not really, it looks like paint, but I mean, it's a coating to help preserve the metal, but also to look good. Yes, okay. it'll it, just to have that rust finish, so okay. you don't have to do too much maintenance on that. Okay. Now, the tubes that are there are going to have some kind of paint on them, I think. Um, the leaves will remain as this, and, and I think the Arts Commission chose a dark blue color to go with the orange patina. Mm -hmm. So it'll be that orange and blue like Oak Harbor mm -hmm. colors for thing. Um, one thing that's not included as part of this and we're not discussing it even at the Arts Commission is the possibility to actually have lighting for this uh, later on. Um, and with this perforated leaf, I think uh, the lighting will be a little more interesting based on where you place it. So uh, during the nighttime, you can still see it. If, if we do the lighting later. Mm -hmm. That's much later. Much later. But there is plans for that. So we'll, we'll have it installed, let the community absorb it, and 
and get familiar with it, and then we can do other improvements to it uh, as and when council feels. You said it's going to be orange and blue. Well, orange in the sense as as orange as a rust will get. Okay. Not not like this orange. Okay. Uh, like a rusty. And the other side. That will be the same. It'll be the back. The what was you know, the blue you were just talking the, about? The the uh, pipes, the, the pipes. lines. Oh, okay. And they're, they're really dark. You, I don't, it's not like a navy blue. It's really dark gray. I was wondering blue. because I, I understood it to be the leaf on one side was blue and on the other oh, side. Oh, no, no. Was yeah, rust. no, the pipe. Just the I pipe. Say, I can't get that in my head. <laughs> but I can get the other one there. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Kamak. And we'll move on to uh, section three. A, our last item today, emerging issues, discussion on low impact uh, development option. Uh, we've got our city attorney, Nikki Esparza, joining us, and our development services director. Uh, I feel bad, I have no exhibits, no things to hand around, uh, but I also feel good because we are in the unusual position of delivering good news to the council when we're talking about LID as a topic. Uh, so as you can see, uh, updated presentation from last month's workshop. Much of these first few slides will be familiar to you. Uh, you, of course, know we had to adopt the permit by the end of the year. You knew the, the ideas that we had relative to how those standards apply to approved projects versus new projects. Uh, we talked to you about a, a sort of a pivotal uh, court case uh, that uh, at first looked like it was good news uh, in terms of how we were going to administer stormwater regulations, treating them like development regulations, investing, that general concept that I think you're pretty familiar with. Uh, we then talked about the not so good news where uh, that decision was appealed to the state Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, hold on, not so fast. Uh, we can't treat stormwater regulations like regular regulations, and so the vesting idea went out the window. Um, last month, then, we gave you our initial response to that particular ruling, um, and what it, our initial response was that it looked like we were going to have to tell people who had previously approved projects um, that they would have to use the new standards. Uh, that conclusion in our, our uh, information for you was based upon looking at the court's ruling, uh, receiving preliminary input from outside sources such as uh, the Master Builders Association's uh, attorneys, as well as other uh, city attorneys, municipal attorneys across the state. Uh, and so we shared with you those uh, considerations and those conclusions at your workshop. We did them as quickly as we could so that our customers would know about them. Um, but that didn't sit right with us, and we just really didn't think that that was the way that things should be. Uh, and so we went back and looked at the court's ruling, and by we, I mean, of course, Nikki, uh, went back and, and looked at the court's ruling, and, and, and what we got out of that was it really stressed the need to follow the permit. Um, and the court took special notice of the time frame by which compliance with the permit for certain projects is not required. Uh, and so we've, I've put for you here on the screen that a, a section out of the permit, uh, and it's fairly jargony, uh, but the really important part there is it tells us that we have to adopt standards to meet that S5C4AI, which is really making LID mandatory. Um, and it has to apply to all applications submitted on or after January 1st, 2017, so far so good. Uh, it shall apply to applications submitted prior to that date, which have not started construction by January 1st, 2022. And that was the part that seemed at odds with what we thought we had learned from the state Supreme Court and what others were thinking about this topic. Um, interestingly enough, there's, a, there's some footnotes in there that you really want to pay attention to, um, in which Department of Ecology defines application in a way which is different than, than most definitions, and it's a little more simple, which in this case is good for us and good for our applicants. Uh, an application means, at a minimum, a complete project description, a site plan, and if applicable, a SEPA checklist. So pretty simple stuff. And that's the key here for us. Uh, and so looking at it more closely, the permit language in concert with this, the court's ruling, the permit language really seemed to apply to the project and not the individuals with the individual permits within the project, which is the common sense approach as opposed to, okay, you had something previously approved, but now 
all, all bets are off. And every new permit that's part of that, old, that previously approved project has to meet the new standards. And again, that just didn't make sense to us. And so city attorney, uh, DSD and engineering staff studied and discussed the language. Uh, Mrs. Sparsa got opinions from other city attorneys, although I think she uh, said that not all of them were willing to weigh in. Um, I, I phrasing that more kindly than what she did. Um, uh, and what we ended up doing was trying to take a common sense approach. Uh, and frankly, we were sort of at odds with what other communities were doing, yet it seemed to be a very defensible position for us. And so uh, in light of that work, we arrived at a revised opinion, which is that uh, projects meeting the Department of Ecology's definition of application submitted prior to January 1st, 2017, and that start construction before January 1st, 2022 are not subject to the 2012 stormwater regulations. Um, we've informed all of our applicants who, who sort of fall into this range who were at risk of having to redo their projects. We've sent letters to them going into way more detail than what I've just shared with you, but concluding with the punchline, which is, this is good news for you. Um, and then interestingly enough, just a few days after that letter went out, uh, we were validated by the Department of Ecology. Uh, big sigh of relief all the way around. Uh, Ecology came out with what you see on the screen, which basically says the same thing, that if the stormwater was figured out at the project level, so think whole subdivision, um, that you don't have to apply the new rules for every building permit inside of that subdivision. And so common sense has prevailed, coupled with the language in the permit um, that was already there, but perhaps was not fully understood um, by everybody who was studying the issue. And so uh, we're really pleased to tell you that people who have previously approved projects or got in the door with a vest with a I'm sorry a complete application prior to the end of 2016 are now able to use the 2005 rules, um, and we've shared that with the folks who are most affected. So um, that's pretty much a summary of what I just told you. Questions? Yes, that is good news. Thank you. Besides mailing them a letter, this is probably a very small group. Can we you? personally follow up with a phone call just to extend our customer service in the city, just to sure. make sure they understand yeah, what's going on and don't read a letter of legalese, and I'm sure the letter was fairly clear, but I received some feedback from those same individuals that were very concerned and frustrated, so I think just that outreach would be, no, be happy to. We've heard back from a couple of them, um, just some just minor clarification questions. Uh, so, but no, it's like, six applicants. Okay. And hopefully that'll help expedite as we need stress the need for more housing that it will encourage them to move forward. So although Here's ironically we've heard from one that they still intend to use the two thousand and twelve manual. Uh, they may think it's to their benefit. So or they think it may be to their benefit. Let me rephrase it that way. So they're going to explore that. Um, but we wanted to let them know that from our perspective they are able to use the EO five manual. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I too would like to thank staff. I know that uh, um, you were working hard on that. I know that it was a uh, it was an effort that involved uh, the engineers, development services, legal, and and uh, the the common sense approach. And I think we were kind of out there a little bit for a while, or felt like we were, uh, but felt uh, felt good about uh, that process, and then to have it have the Department of Ecology um, come around to that. I, I uh, appreciate uh, a lot of hard work there. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mayor. I, I'm literally just the talking head today. Um, the work was elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. Anyone else? Yes, Councilor Staff, Allenberg. Staff, you want to have to hear me yapping about this anymore. For a while. Ms. Munns, are you writing that down? So yeah. <laughs> it's on tape. Oh, OK. <laughs> And we have seven whole minutes left, Mayor. We seven leave, minutes leave, left? Leave, yeah. Leave yeah. Five I'd say that we're going to adjourn early. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.